Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. It's the loons, Matthew. The loons. It's the Looney Tunes. Uh, welcome to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown here in Langley, British Columbia, and Matthew Stockton, my good buddy, is in Vancouver. How are you, Matthew? Good. I think I should start saying my name at the beginning. And this is Matthew Stockton coming at you. If you want to say that, you can. <laughs> I don't mind. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. I've been meditating more recently. That's good. You know how my New Year's resolution was just to be kinder to myself, even though I've been giving myself a hard time about a few things. Meditating has been really good. Really good. I've been meditating every day. I do walking meditations in the morning. Walking meditations are nice, too. I like to go out in the woods to do that, so... Well, I walk very early, and I, I walk the other direction now, but we're, ta- we're going to be talking about Stanley Park a lot on this episode. That's why, you know, walking meditation is a great segue into this. Yeah, I used to walk towards Stanley Park, but when the streetlights stop, it was too scary for me to go and do that when it's pitch black and I just stop at the edge and turn around. (laughs) I've got like a really bright little flashlight that works great for that stuff. Yeah, but still traipsing around at 4am in Stanley Park. uh, Not a good idea after you hear this episode. (laughs) Right. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. In episode 13 of Dark Poutine, we covered the Babes in the Woods case, a tragic and long unsolved mystery from Vancouver. In 1953, the skeletal remains of two children were discovered in Stanley Park, one of Canada's largest urban parks. What made this case particularly haunting was that the children were found with a hatchet that appeared to have been used to end their lives. Then they'd been covered with a woman's fur coat. The identities of the two children remained unknown for almost 70 years until, in 2022, using DNA genealogy, the Vancouver police were able to identify the boys believed to have died sometime in 1947. They were 7-year-old Derek and 6-year-old David Dalton. Their mother, Eileen Busquette, who died in 1996, told relatives at the time that social services had taken the boys as she was unable to care for them. No one knows for sure what happened leading up to their deaths, and as so much time has passed, it's doubtful we ever will. At least they have their names back. This is Dark Poutine Episode 301 Update, Stanley Park's Babes in the Woods Identified. The scene of the crime, Stanley Park in Vancouver, known as the city's crown jewel, has a rich and complex history. 
celebrated as the top park worldwide by TripAdvisor readers in 2014, it's a serene oasis offering breathtaking views of the Pacific Ocean, the Lionsgate Bridge, and the surrounding areas. Visitors to the park can enjoy its famous seawall walk or explore its densely wooded trails for a more solitary experience. With many attractions, Stanley Park is a must-visit destination in Vancouver. The park, spanning 405 hectares, sits on land traditionally belonging to the Coast Salish people, with archaeological evidence indicating its use by indigenous peoples for over 3,000 years. The first European explorers arrived in the 1790s. Later, its strategic location for protecting Vancouver's port led to its military reserve designation. The park still houses the Naval Reserve Division HMCS Discovery on Dead Man's Island. In 1886, the city of Vancouver leased the military reserve for park use. Two years later, in 1888, Stanley Park was officially inaugurated. It was named in honor of Lord Stanley, Canada's sixth Governor General and donor of the renowned Stanley Cup in hockey. Despite its beauty, the park has witnessed darker moments in history. It contains many unmarked graves near Brockton Point and Dead Man's Island. Two things. First of all, uh, mm-hmm. I had no idea that it was the same Stanley as the Stanley Cup. It is, yeah. So that's really interesting. And also, um, Deadman's Island sounds like a cool name. It's actually named that because the island was an ancient burial site for First Nations people mm. who would lay their dead to rest in cedar boxes perched high up in the trees. Right. And it, that was about going back to nature. Uh, your body essentially goes back to nature in that way. Uh, I would actually, that's the way I'd like to do it. Like a green burial kind of thing? Well, no, just put my body up in a tree and let the birds eat me and then poop me everywhere as fertilizer. I'm, I'm not going to get into my own <laughs> opinions about what you should do with me. In 1889, the park board began removing residents, including Chinese settlers at Anderson Point, reflecting a troubled chapter in Canadian history. A quote from Sean Karaj's paper, Creature Comforts, Remaking the Animal Landscape of Vancouver Stanley Park, 1887 to 1911, recounts this period. Sarah Avison, the daughter of the first park ranger, described the eviction of Chinese settlers. Quote, the park board offered the Chinamen to leave the park. They were trespassers, but the Chinamen would not go. So the park board told my father to set fire to the buildings. I saw them burn. There were five of us children, and you know what children are like when there is a fire. So father set fire to the shacks. What happened to the Chinese, I do not know, end quote. And uh, sorry for the racist language there, but this incident is a stark reminder of the park's complex past and Vancouver's often racist history amidst its natural beauty. I actually, when I was doing the um, history of the Chinese in Canada, I I came across that, but it didn't quite make the cut because, um, as you know, Mike, I was supposed to write one episode and it ended up being two. There was so much to tell. That's the thing. It's so hard to know what to leave out of an episode uh, as far as detail. Yeah. The first time I told this story back in episode 13, I had this part in there. But once again, here's more evidence of how the Chinese immigrants were treated here in Canada. Not well. Not well. So as the park is secluded, it's been the scene of several brutal murders over the years. For example, as Matthew and I covered in episode 166 of Dark Poutine... We told the story of Aaron Zane Donald Webster, a 42-year-old man. He was brutally beaten with a blunt instrument, and his killers had skittered into the night, leaving him to die in the Second Beach parking lot where they'd attacked him. Aaron's death is recognized as Canada's most well-known and notorious case of gay bashing. So this, I remember this one. This is one of the first early episodes that I did with you. Yes, that's right. Yep. You had me come in for, for one, and here I am about, what, 135-something episodes <laughs> later? I'm a bad rat you can't get rid of. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Stanley Park also played host to a notorious incident involving Vancouver police officers who beat suspected drug dealers. The officers became known as the Stanley Park Six. 
The Statement of Agreed Facts presented in B.C. Provincial Court outlines the events of the Stanley Park incident involving the six officers who later pleaded guilty to assault. These officers, Christopher Cronmiller, Raymond Gardner, Duncan Gemmel, James Kenny, Gabriel Kojima, and Brandon Steele, acknowledged that the following events occurred in the late evening of January 13th and the early morning of January 14th, 2003. The incident began when Acting Sergeant Chima, in charge of the shift, investigated Grant Wilson for drug possession on Granville Street, assisted by Constables Gardner and Gemmel. Wilson resisted and was subsequently arrested and released at Main and Hastings Streets. Around the same time, Wilson, along with Jason Desjardins, Barry Laurie, and Shannon Pritchard, were suspected of a drug interaction near Cons Market and were arrested. Later, at Stanley Park's Third Beach, the detainees were subjected to physical and verbal abuse by the officers. Lori was the first to be removed from the police wagon and was berated and physically confronted by the officers. Following him, Desjardins was punched and shoved, and finally, Wilson was pushed, punched, and verbally abused, resulting in minor injuries. During this process, various forms of physical and verbal abuse occurred. Lori was berated and poked by Gemmel and shoved by Steele and Kojima. Desjardins was punched by Gemmel, shoved by Gardner, and struck with a baton by Kojima. Wilson was pushed, punched, and shoved by multiple officers, resulting in minor abrasions. Throughout this event, Constable Kenny, who had taken over as acting sergeant, observed the incidents from a distance without engaging. He did not physically or verbally engage with the victims. Following the incident, the officers attended a debriefing meeting at the VPD station to discuss the events. Later, Gemmel filed a report that omitted any mention of physical contact with the victims at Stanley Park or the presence of Constable Peters, a seventh officer who had been at the scene. A week following the incident, Constable Peters disclosed his knowledge of the events to his higher-ups. An investigation ensued, and the officers involved were later charged with assault, to which, as we mentioned, they later pleaded guilty. They all avoided jail. Constable Gemmel, the oldest of the officers, received a 60-day house arrest and six months probation for leading the assault. Constable Kojima got a 30-day house arrest and six months parole for using his baton. Constable Gardner was handed a nine-month suspended sentence and six months probation for berating and shoving, while Constable Steele received a similar suspended sentence and probation. Constable Cronmiller, who pushed a victim, got a conditional discharge and probation. Constable Kenny, who only observed the incident, received an absolute discharge. The Globe and Mail later reported at one point, after the attack, Constable Peters said, Constable Gabriel Kojima turned to him and said, Now that was the shit you signed up for. A CBC News article indicated Constable Troy Peters told the inquiry that Constable Raymond Gardner told the first victim, Barry Laurie, that the people on Granville Street were, quote, tired of drug dealers and that, quote, the police own Granville Street and it's now time for alternative measures, end quote. The same article included Constable Peter's partial description of the beating of Jason Desjardins. Quote, People started to punch, said Peters. It was a flurry of punches. After being struck several times, he fell to the ground. He was on his back with his hands to his head. Then they began to kick him. End quote. A later report by Chief of Police Jamie Graham indicated one victim's head was, quote, kicked like a soccer ball. Four of the officers were disciplined and demoted. Constables Gabriel Kojima and Duncan Gemmel were fired. You know, it's interesting that they did this at Third Beach. So, mm -hmm. so Third Beach is the one that sort of furthest away from any busy areas. It right. Is, it's quite secluded, right? Yep. And they probably figured no one would see them, so they're misbehaving, right? And mm -hmm. and they probably wouldn't have thought that Peters would have told the higher up. So, you know, I think as a society, we want police to follow their training and deal with people in a fair way, even when no one's around, right? Right, yeah. But it's, um, you know, Peters should have stopped it then, but flip side of that is I'm glad he reported it. Yeah. 
The story of Stanley Park's Babes in the Woods case begins on January 14, 1953, when a Vancouver Parks board worker named Albert Tong was helping to clear brush to prevent forest fires deep in the park about halfway between Lionsgate Bridge and Beaver Lake. While tending to his chore, Tong stepped on something under the brush that cracked loudly under his weight. Clearing the brush and debris away, he found that what he had stepped on was a human skull. Investigating the find further, he was horrified to find the bones of two small skeletons covered by a woman's fur coat. Tong didn't report his discovery until the following day. His motives for keeping his horrible secret are unknown. We can only speculate. Perhaps, as Albert Tong was Chinese, he had a distrust for the Vancouver police and feared he might be implicated in the crime. Shock and trauma may have also played a part. Discovering a crime scene can lead to confusion, panic, or disbelief, preventing immediate logical thinking or reporting. Tong led Vancouver police officers to the area the next day, and they began their meticulous investigation. After carefully clearing away what appeared to be a few years of detritus, they discovered the remains of two children. They were assumed to be different ages, as one was larger than the other. The smaller skeleton was laying face down, its skull wearing a World War II leather airman's cap. There was another matching leather cap near the second larger skeleton with a set of aviator goggles. Both were still wearing their shoes and clad in decomposing clothing. A lunchbox with rotted contents was also found between the bodies. Along with the rotting fur coat that had been covering the bones, police found a single woman's size 7.5 penny loafer. The discovery of an 11 centimeter wide shingler's hatchet with a broken handle was most telling. The hatchet's blade was compared to the wounds found on one skull and fit perfectly. The other body sustained wounds that appeared to match the hammer end of the hatchet. Although unable to determine the exact cause of death due to the state of decomposition, a decent assumption could be made that the hatchet was the murder weapon. According to a blog post on the Vancouver Police Museum site by Sheena Koo in 2014, quote, a doctor, not a forensic pathologist, was called to the site. He stated that the bones came from a young boy and girl, roughly aged 5 to 7 and 7 to 9, end quote. No one had reported any missing children who fit the descriptions of these two. It is now believed that the initial misgendering of the smaller boy led police away from viable leads and played a significant role in the case remaining unsolved for so long. After all the evidence had been gathered, it was brought to the city morgue, now the location of the Vancouver Police Museum, where some of it remains. The coroner and pathologist undertook putting things back together as best they could to try to determine what happened to these two children. My husband and I have a cleaner that comes in once a week to clean the house. You call him your man-maid. The man-maid. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And here's a fun fact. He, he's, he's actually been the cleaner f for years for the Vancouver Police Museum as well. Ah. But uh, I, I haven't been able to get him to t tell me any stories of, of ghosts or anything while he's you know cleaning it in the middle of the night when no one's around. Well, the morgue there has an autopsy table as well, and it is also the place where Errol Flynn's body was taken when he died here in Vancouver. In Lake Flynn. In Lake Flynn, yeah, there's a whole long story about that. But my friend Chris used to be the curator of the Vancouver Police Museum, so I have oh. seen behind the scenes, I've seen different things that aren't on display, and somewhere on the internet is a picture of me holding a hand grenade at the <laughs> Vancouver oh, Police gosh. Museum. <laughs> you and a hand grenade. Run, everybody. Exactly. Renowned forensic anthropologist, Erna Engel Beersdorf, a survivor of both Auschwitz and Buchenwald concentration camps during the final year of World War II, played a pivotal role in attempts to solve this tragic historical case after moving to Vancouver shortly after her release. Called upon by the police, Beersdorf took on the challenging task of reconstructing the faces of the two young victims using plaster casts of their skulls. This meticulous work was critical in an era when determining the time of death was difficult due to limited scientific methods and advanced decomposition. Again, 
as one of the victims was thought to have been a young girl, the reconstructions are representative of that error. Beersdorf's investigation extended beyond facial reconstruction. Scrutinizing the victim's clothing, she deduced that the crime occurred post-World War II, around 1947, based on the style of shoes the children were wearing, which were not available until then. The size of the adult penny loafer and fur coat found at the scene suggested the perpetrator was stocky, approximately 5 foot 3 inches tall, and weighed between 125 and 135 pounds. However, this information alone wasn't enough to pinpoint a suspect, adding another piece to the complex puzzle. In a novel approach, the police recreated the older boy's entire outfit using clothing from Woodward's department store and displayed it on a mannequin for photographs. They hoped releasing these images in their annual report and in newspapers would trigger someone's memory. Perhaps someone had seen the children wearing their aviator caps around the park in 1947, although such caps were very common then. The story and photos, once published, generated an overwhelming response. Over 100 individuals across the nation claimed to have seen two children in the park in 1947. Among the multitude of tips, one stood out significantly. A woman from West Vancouver who maintained a diary over the years recalled a particular memory while breaking up with her boyfriend in the park. She claimed to remember seeing a young woman accompanied by two children in the park, noting that she carried a small hatchet and wore a coat similar to the one found with the bodies. The witness said she had overheard the woman calling one of the boys Ronnie or Rodney as she and her fiancé walked past them. I wonder if she hadn't been breaking up with her boyfriend would she have remembered seeing them? Right. Because yeah. that sort of heightened emotional time, your senses are, are, are more on, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. I can't remember much of my time with, with one of my exes, but I do vividly remember throwing a roast beef across the room when we were breaking up. Oh, uh, dear. Don't, don't worry, not at him. It was just, it was just flung, it was, it was flung across the room. Wow. Poor roast beef. That, you know, <laughs> you know, a cow died for that roast beef, Matthew. Well, we were having guests over, so we picked it up and brushed it off and served it to them anyway. Oh, good for you. <laughs> we got through the um, entertaining for the evening, and, and I moved out the next day. I digress. So, so this woman, you say, yes, it's an emotional event, so that would lead somebody to write in their diary, number yeah. one. Uh, and number two, there's more memories around things that are emotionally charged in some yeah. way. For yeah. sure. Another witness came forward with a similar story to the West Vancouver person, but it was determined he wasn't in the park until at least 1951, four years after the murders. In a bit of irony, one of the people who called in a tip about a pair of children missing in New Westminster at the time was the mother of his then seven-year-old Clifford Olson, who after admitting to the murders of 11 local children himself, would become known as the Beast of BC in the 1980s. It's so incredible. Right. So incredible. And, and uh, you know, but I'm also sitting here thinking, imagine how hard it would be to be a family member of somebody like that. You, you just get tarred with the brush. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've mentioned it on the show before, uh, it, actually in the episode that we did. I know Cody Lejabakov's uncle, and Cody Lejabakov is uh, a serial killer from northern British Columbia along right. the Highway of Tears. So uh, I know his uncle, and his uncle was devastated, you know, because he knew this person, like Lejabakov was 19 when he did the killing. So, right. you know, he knew this person as a kid in the family kind of thing not a, obviously not a serial killer yeah and if you know him and you're friendly with him he's he's probably a, a, a stand-up guy and it's just you know my point is you know a lot of people like it it's the, the the closeness being having been close to a serial killer people wonder about everyone who is close to them sometimes you yeah know? yeah the various tips received in the investigation of stanley park's babes in the woods led to dead ends with all promising leads ultimately being explained away. Consequently, the remains of the children and the evidence collected at the scene were initially stored in the basement of Vancouver's coroner's court downtown. 
Over time, some of these items were put on display at the Vancouver Police Museum, which police officers created in the 1980s. The Babes in the Woods display, as well as clothing and the alleged murder weapon, included replicas of a few of the bones found, along with replicas of the boys' skulls. Despite the efforts of various individuals who took on the task of investigating this case over the years, none were successful in solving it. One cop, Detective Sergeant Brian Honeyburn, grabbed the reins of the case in 1996 and pursued answers to the puzzle for the rest of his career. More after a quick break. And we are back. Matthew, thoughts so far on this case? Yeah, you know, what I find amazing is, um, in cases like this, is how people like Honeyburn and others, and maybe even we as a society, tend to not just say, oh well, after so many decades, mm -hmm. uh, and continue to try to figure out who, who killed the children. Yeah. But I, I do sort of ponder, though, as, as a society, we tend to not do the same for for people like indigenous people victims of residential school murdered and missing indigenous women right yeah and um you know we need more honey burns um for for these lost and sort of forgotten souls yeah not to get into a bit of what aboutism in yeah. in the show there's enough of that in the world right now yeah but you're right why are these two kids so compelling yeah. As opposed to hundreds of others who seem to go ignored. I don't mean it in terms of what about ism. I just, it, you know, as you were going through this, um, it just, you know, I was like, wow, it's great to have people like this. And, mm -hmm. and it's more, I'd like more people like this to, um, to, to, to help, right? <laughs> Well, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. We do our little part. We have a few a thousand listeners a month, and maybe one of those people needs to hear something like what we've talked about. Yeah. The case had remained open since the bodies had been discovered. And as we mentioned before the break, in 1996, Brian Honeyburn, head of the Provincial Unsolved Homicide Unit and a member of the Vancouver Police Major Crime Section, took over the search for answers. While growing up in the 1950s, Honeyburn had overheard his parents discussing the case and had haunted him ever since. He later told the Globe and Mail how sad the case made him feel over the years. He said, quote, It's very sad. They missed their whole life. End quote. In 1998, deciding to leverage technological advancements, he reached out to Dr. David Sweet, a professor and expert at the Bureau of Legal Dentistry at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Sweet utilized modern techniques to extract DNA from the teeth in the children's skulls. The DNA analysis brought to light a significant revelation. Contrary to initial beliefs, the two murdered children were not a boy and a girl, but were both boys. Moreover, it was discovered that they were brothers, sharing the same mother but having different fathers. Sweet and Honeyburn were cautiously optimistic that the DNA analysis would give a few new leads. Sweet told the Globe and Mail, quote, of course, as the case gets older and older, so do the leads and opportunities for identification, end quote. Dr. Sweet held on to the DNA samples, hoping that one day, after further advancements in the science, they might lead to names of the two youngsters. The internet has become a significant investigation tool as its popularity has grown. The Doe Network eventually became involved in this case. According to their website, quote, the Doe Network is a 100% volunteer organization devoted to assisting investigating agencies in bringing closure to national and international cold cases concerning missing and unidentified persons. It is their mission to give the nameless back their names and return the missing to their families, end quote. In their description of the boys listed on their site as 68 UMBC and 69 UMBC, the Doe Network set out the circumstances of the discovery of the skeletons, which we have previously outlined. The site also gives what at the time was believed to be the most significant lead in the case. Quote, Vancouver police wish to identify a woman and two boys who may or may not have been involved with this case. In 1949 or 1950, a man who worked in a logging camp and his companion picked up a woman with two children. During the ride, 
She had told the men that she had been in trouble with the mission police for vagrancy charges. They learned that one or both of her children attended Cedar Valley School at some time and that she lived on Cherry Street in Mission, B.C. This lead, again, turned out to be a false one, as we'll find out. After the DNA testing was complete, Honeyburn collected the bones and had the boys cremated. Honeyburn proceeded to scatter their ashes in the ocean near Kitts Beach, utilizing a police boat for the task. He noted that the occurrence of the annual children's festival at the same time was a serendipitous coincidence. You know, he sounds like a decent human being. A hundred percent. Right? Like, he, he recognizes these, what are just bones at this point, he recognizes them as, as being remains of kids. Right. And, and cared enough to give them some sort of send-off, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if not him, then maybe nobody would have done it. True. Honeyburn later spoke with Glenn Schaefer of the province newspaper. He said, quote, I got some criticism for doing that, and some people asked me why I didn't scatter their ashes in Stanley Park, but I told them, these kids were murdered there. Why would they want to be buried there? I guess you can't please everyone, end quote. Yeah, I just ignore the haters, Honeyburn. You, you did more than, you know, these people behind their keyboards bitching about stuff. And, and yep. you're right, I wouldn't want to be scattered or buried where i was murdered that's just kind of um wrong <laughs> right you know exactly throughout his career honeyburn carried on chasing leads feeling he owed it to the boys to give them back their names honeyburn's exceptional service earned him a police exemplary service medal on october 6 1988 and he was awarded a first bar to that award on november 12 1998 he retired in 2001 after serving in the Vancouver Police Department for over 32 years, spending the latter part of his career with the British Columbia Unsolved Homicide Unit. In 1999, he joined a forensic team sent to Kosovo after NATO's invasion to investigate war crimes and assist in exhuming mass graves. In 2013, 12 years after he retired, the boys were still on Brian Honeyburn's mind. He told the Globe and Mail that he didn't think there would ever be a prosecution in the case. He said, quote, That will never happen, not now. Probably the perpetrator of this terrible crime is long deceased. He continued, quote, They get murdered in a major city, in a park, and we don't know who they are. They're two little guys that lost their lives way too early through no fault of their own. I think it's incumbent upon us to try and figure out who they are, end quote. The article indicated that, looking at the evidence, Honeyburn always surmised that the boys had been murdered by their mother. It was not until 2022 that an answer finally came. Inspector Dale Weidman, commanding officer of the Vancouver Police Department's Major Crime Section, oversaw the facilitation of a new scientific analysis of the boys' DNA at Lakehead University's Paleo DNA Lab in Orillia, Ontario. According to the university's website in March 2021, Redgrave Research Forensic Services enlisted the lab's help for its proficiency in handling ancient and degraded DNA as part of a genetic genealogy approach initiated for the Vancouver police. Lab manager Stephen Frat Pietro, a Lakehead alumnus and longtime lab staff member, explained the challenges of working with DNA degraded by environmental factors like sunlight and water. Redgrave provided the lab with a tooth and a piece of cranium from each child for nuclear DNA extraction, which was then used for whole genome sequencing. The Paleo DNA lab, known for solving other high-profile cases, worked without prior knowledge of the samples to avoid bias. The DNA extraction process involving sterilization, bone crushing, and chemical breakdown faced initial setbacks due to insufficient DNA. However, a second attempt with a larger bone sample proved successful. Redgrave then matched the extracted DNA with private genealogical and ancestry companies' databases, including GEDmatch, eventually identifying a relative, one of the boy's maternal grandparents. Detective Constable Ada Rodriguez of the VPD later revealed that a family member had uploaded familial DNA seeking answers about the boy's who were believed to have been taken by social services. Describing the family's reaction to this startling development, Rodriguez said, quote, It's hard to fathom the shock of getting a call from a homicide detective who suggests you might be related to victims in an old case, end quote. 
When police contacted the family member, they were initially taken aback, but quickly inquired if the matter was about one of their parents' missing brothers. What's that old saying, Mike? Old sins cast long shadows? Yeah. 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 So according to Eve Lazarus, it was Allie Brady, a great niece of the boys, curious about the two missing youngsters in their family's history who had always wanted answers and submitted her DNA and some others in the family to the genealogy website MyHeritage, holding on to a hope that the boys were still living. However, instead of finding the boys, they received that unexpected call from law enforcement. The mother of the boys, Eileen Busquette, was born in Alberta, was of both Métis and Russian heritage, and was a mother of three. Eileen's daughter and Allie Brady's grandmother was the oldest. She was born in 1937. Derek, the oldest of the boys, was born on February 27, 1940, and David was born on June 24, 1941. All the children were born in Vancouver and attended Henry Hudson Elementary School in Kitsilano. The family had lived in poverty at 1535 Arbutus Street and struggled to keep a roof over their heads. Yeah, you know, there were real areas of poverty in, in, in Vancouver back then. I mean, I mean, you look at Arbutus Street now and there's, it's not, right? It's mm-hmm. all very expensive. And it, it's sad how the difference now is that if you're in poverty at that to that level, you, you actually don't have a roof over your head. You're on the street. At the time of the familial DNA sampling, Diane, though still living, was suffering from dementia and could not be of much assistance in the search for answers. Family members had asked about the boys over the years, but were told, quote, we don't talk about that. The VPD investigated Eileen's claim that the boys had been taken into care, but could find no evidence to support that claim. The VPD website gave more insight into the boys' short lives, quote, BPD now believes that Derek and David were descendants of Russian immigrants who came to Canada at the turn of the 20th century. The victims who lived in Vancouver had a family member who lived near the entrance to Stanley Park at the time of their death. Investigators theorize the person who killed Derek and David was a close relative who died approximately 25 years ago, end quote. According to a Vancouver is Awesome post by Brendan Kerrigan, After the news conference at which the VPD identified the boys, Inspector Weidman was frank that the number one suspect in the murder of the boys was their mother, but stopped short of naming her. Quote, We make that assumption, said Weidman, so she would definitely be a person of interest if this case occurred today. Naturally, we would be looking at the mother, end quote. He continued, quote, At this stage of the investigation, it was never about seeing someone charged or arrested for the crimes, We always knew, especially given the passage of time, that that was extremely unlikely. But it was always about giving these boys a name and finally telling their story. End quote. Weidman concluded, quote, These murders have haunted generations of homicide investigators, and we are relieved to now give these children a name and to bring some closure to this horrific case. Although significant folklore has surrounded this case for years, we must not forget that these were real children, who died a tragic and heartbreaking death, end quote. Eileen Busquette's family struggles with the idea that the gentle and kind soul they knew could be capable of such a horrific crime. They can't believe she would do such a thing. Eileen was a trusted caregiver, she babysat, and a lover of animals. Yeah, you know, that, that would be hard to comprehend if you knew somebody all their life and uh, who was caring and all those ways and but the truth is we don't know right we're yeah. not si- we're not sitting here saying she did it no um because and we'll never know we we really don't know yeah no when we'll never know which is is even in some ways even more upsetting perhaps for the family right yeah because you know it's like well if she didn't do it they'd i'm sure they'd love to clear her name and if she did do it i'm sure they'd love to at least know the truth right yeah In her recent book, Cold Case BC, Eve Lazarus updated the story in which she interviewed Allie Brady's mom, Cindy. When asked what happened to the boys, Cindy said that Eileen did not want to speak about it and would break into tears. The family also took issue with the size of the overcoat used to cover the boys' bodies. It had been a size 16. Police said at the time of the initial investigation they believed the wearer to have been of stout build. 
However, Eileen Bousquet had been a more petite woman. She passed away at the age of 78 in 1996 and isn't around to defend herself. In her books, Cold Case Vancouver and Cold Case BC, Eve Lazarus reminded us that a critical witness and her then fiancé observed a woman in a fur coat with two young children, both boys in aviator caps, in the park in the fall of 1947. The pair had taken note of the woman as it was a warm day and her fur coat was much too heavy for the weather. They saw the woman again later, running from near the old zoo cages in Stanley Park. The woman appeared distressed, lacking her coat, wore only one shoe, and was notably alone. The witness's detailed description of the boys' clothing included those aviator-style leather caps, coupled with the estimated date of death and ages of the children involved, led police to focus their murder investigation on October 5, 1947, when the lady claimed this had happened. Sadly, other than the clothing she wore, the witness could not describe the woman any further. This account as the woman had been seen with two boys, was initially discounted as the skeletons were thought to be a boy and a girl. Had the police gotten the sex of the remains correct earlier, the chances of solving the crime might have increased significantly. We'll never know. At the time of their identification, investigators still had some of Derek and David Dalton's remains. They have since been returned to their family for proper burial. I'm really curious about the fact that Eileen had three children, and two of them, her youngest, the boys, are dead. So Diane lives, Mm -hmm. goes on to give birth to Cindy, who then gives birth to Allie, who is the one who initiated the whole sort of family search. Mm -hmm. The whole story around the boys, I, I just wonder if there wasn't something else that happened there that perhaps uh, Eileen didn't want to talk about. Perhaps she wasn't the one who was with the boys in the park that day. Maybe not. You know, maybe out of frustration and she had given the boys to somebody to take care of. Maybe it was, you know what, too many mouths to feed. The daughter's the oldest, most developed. Um, I'm. It could have been, hey, the boys are younger, so I'm going to give them up now to somebody else so they can get used to sort of new parents or whatever sooner, right? Right, yeah. You know, when people are living in poverty, they make some hard choices, right? Yeah, yeah. And maybe that person, whoever ended up with the boys, like maybe it wasn't an official adoption or an official child services. You know, maybe she's embarrassed to say, no, I just gave them to a neighbor or I gave them to somebody else, right? As right. To, maybe that person just was the evil one, you know? Yeah, right. So, so, you, so we truly, you know, I don't, I kind of don't want to walk away from this episode with people thinking the mom did it because it's just still way too loose to, to even go, it's likely or anything like that. I don't, you know, I think it's it's too loose. Yeah. Yeah. And that is it for Dark Poutine episode 301 update, Stanley Park's Babes in the Woods Identified. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. I like watching Matthew dance to our little jingle. I always dance during that. Yeah, it's really funny. Anyway, uh, yeah, we've got a few voicemails. uh, I think three this week. So let's get to the first one. Hey, side, you're my go-to to listen to in the bathtub. Really, really good shows. Um, I was wondering, my name's Dennis. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta. I was wondering if you heard of the Edmonton Notorious Landlord. I think there might be a really good story there. Nobody really loved him, and nobody missed him when he got shot down in front of his house in Edmonton, Alberta. Okay, guys, thanks. And take a shit in your hat. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Thanks, Dennis. <laughs> I hope Dennis is having a warm bath today because I, I heard from my aunt uh, that uh, the wind chills minus 60 in Edmonton yesterday. That's ridiculous. <laughs> that, like, that is like... That's ridiculous. That's like Hoth from Empire Strikes Back. It's that cold. You can't go out because your tauntaun will freeze. <laughs> I, I, I've not heard of this notorious landlord, have you? No. No, but I, I'll look into it. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully, most, most, most landlords are a little bit notorious. <laughs> right. Hopefully, Dennis isn't the person who's calling to admit to something, but anyway. <laughs> or, or that it's his nasty landlord. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Or yeah, like he's planning to do something. I don't know. I uh, wonder. I wonder if he called while he was in the bathtub. Yeah, that's what he said. No, he so. said he listens in the bathtub. Oh, so maybe he was. Yeah, call. He wasn't in the bathtub. Maybe I he think was I listening. might have heard a little dog there too. Yeah, like a little dog. <laughs> <laughs> Versus well, Steve's whoop. Well, what does Dennis do there in uh, Edmonton? He's clearly not a landlord. He, he installs bathtubs. <laughs> he installs bathtubs. <laughs> He's a bathtub well, installer. Well, that just makes sense. <laughs> uh, let's move on to our second voicemail. Hey, this is Maddie from Edmonton, Alberta. Um, just first-time caller, long-time listener. I love the podcast. I love the different perspective that you guys bring to uh, these stories, it's awesome to listen to, and great while I'm doing chores to just <laughs> listen to these and keeps me going. Um, yeah, just call in to see what my occupation is and tell you to go take a shit in your tuk. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, thanks, Maddie. Um, yeah, that interesting. Two callers in a row from Edmonton. So th thank you, Alberta, for stepping up. And especially after I crapped on Alberta in the or Edmonton specifically in the first uh, time we did the Mark Twitchell episodes, so I said something that a friend of mine from Edmonton said, and uh, people from Edmonton got really angry at so me. So it's one of those things where the locals are allowed to say it, but you're not, Mike. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I have since remedied that, and we have we have now a lot of friends from Edmonton. I I think I think Oh Matthew your ride's coming. <laughs> <Out of your wagon. laughs> okay, it's gone now. Okay. I think she owns one of those fun bars on White Ave. Okay. I don't know White Ave or any of the fun bars there. White Ave is um my aunt and uncle live near near it, and there's lots, okay. of, lots of cool bars and clubs on, on White Ave, and so I think I think she owns a bar there. There you go. What's the name of the bar? Oh, I now now he has to think. The White Ave Brew Pub. There you go. <laughs> I don't know if that's a real one or not. <laughs> it might. Who knows? If it, it is, it is. Either the and so she does that, but also during the day. Right, because most of the time she inspects the bathtub installation. She's an inspector of bathtubs, so she inspects Dennis's bathtub installation. Well, she, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> I'm pre I'm pretty sure Dennis is really good at his job, but it's nice to have somebody to go after you and sort of just say, "Hey, you made a little bit of a mistake here." The because inspector. I know I love it when people email me about uh, the mistakes that I've made on the show. That's fun. That's fun to get those emails. Well, thanks, anyway. <laughs> well, Mike, yeah, yeah. acceptance is key. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> All right, we do have one more uh, voicemail. Uh, let's have a listen. Hi, this is uh, Tom McMahon, Pinawa, Manitoba. Uh, I listened to your part one of Chinese Exclusion, and I have to say I've never heard anything so good. Uh, uh, in Canadian media covering that subject or covering uh, the topic of racism in such a sensitive way. It was it was fantastic uh, to hear that. Thank you. Oh. So I got an email from Tom as well. Uh, so we don't have to give Tom a job because... He sounds like a professor to me. Well, Tom is a pretty smart cookie. Yeah. Tom is the former executive secretary of the Manitoba Aboriginal Justice Inquiry. Ah, excellent. And general legal counsel of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. 
fantastic. If we're getting a little bit of props from somebody who has done those particular jobs, I think we're headed in the right direction. I'm really, really happy. Really happy. As we'd say back home in the in the UK, I'm well chuffed. Yeah. Thank you, Tom, for calling us. And Tom actually made some suggestions about other cases that I'm going to start to look into them. And okay. he has some papers that he's written specifically, white papers that he's shared with me. So for sure, we'll probably hear a little more from Tom McMahon on the podcast. That's great. Thanks so so much, Tom. That that. I worked hard on those, and Mike helped me edit, and it's quite meaningful to hear that from you. Who knows? Maybe Tom wants to be a guest one day, and we'll have him on. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. So on to Patreon and Donut Money donors. And as far as Patreon goes, this one actually means a lot to me. Uh, so our last episode was about the about Daniel Levesque, a young man who I feel mm-hmm. really close to now. Um, mm-hmm. And we had his mom in the second part, Stacy talking to us about Daniel, what she's been through, what her family went through, and now what the perpetrator is up to. Stacy Thur from Revelstoke is our newest patron. So oh, that you, means Stacey. the world to me that, uh, you know, that she wants to support the show in that way. That really, Thank you. That really moved me when I saw that. Thank you so much, Stacy. And we don't have to give Stacy a job because we know she's an engineer for the railroad and she teaches as well for uh, the railroad. So that's kind of cool. And I hope you call her a new friend, Mike. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I really do believe we're friends <laughs> now. Um, and uh, we plan on getting together, uh, I think, in April. She was here for her granny's 101st birthday. Wow. Yesterday, 101. So happy birthday to uh, Granny, Stacy Thurs <laughs> Granny. Yeah, that's so cool. 101. That's a that's a Good that's fact. a long time. I want I want to ask her what her secret is. A friend of mine who was very old one time I said, "How do you st-? like what is it? What's your secret?" And he said, "You don't die." <laughs> <laughs> It's like, okay. I saw a woman interviewed uh, an article the other day. She's 100, and they asked her, and she said, two Dr. Peppers a day. Oh, I saw that one, and she was grumpy. She was a a grumpy lady drinking her Dr. Pepper. (laughs) I like Dr. Pepper. Yeah. Uh, We did have some donut money this week. Uh, Other sodas available. Other sodas available, but Dr. Pepper and root beer are good. Uh, (laughs) Brianna Sigurdsson. Brianna, Brianna. yes, she says, thanks for the podcast and keeping me company while nesting slash preparing for my first baby. Happy New Year. Ah. So first baby, wow, Uh, if it's a boy, name it Steve, maybe? (laughs) Or Matthew. Matthew. (laughs) But definitely not Michael. (laughs) There's too many Michaels in the world. And if it's a girl, Matilda. Matilda. Oh, dear. Uh (laughs) <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure she's nobody ever is going to name their child after one of us. <laughs> oh, I, I hope <laughs> not. That, that, that's a have lot of higher hope. I have higher hopes for your children, right? And that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. You've got a namesake out there, like holy smokes! You've got to be a good egg for the rest of your life. But anyway, mm. uh, so thank you. What does Brianna do? Uh, when she's not nesting or preparing for her first baby? She is a v- multimedia artist. A multimedia artist. Oh. He- and and lately, she's been doing NFTs. Oh, boy. And, and she, she sold, the, she got the highest price ever for an NFT. Oh, wow. How much? Yeah. 12 million dollars. American dollars, which is about five billion Canadian dollars. 
<laughs> Matthew's math is terrible, but <laughs> but yes, no, uh, NFTs are a thing. Anyway, it, no, in in my mind, I just like one thousand time American money tars, and in my mind, red cars go faster. Yeah, red cars get pulled over more. I can assure you of that because I had a red car at one point that did get pulled over. However, I was well, I, going very fast. <laughs> well, I did as well, but it was your fault. Oh, you got pulled over because of me? What? In Washington, I was listening to the podcast before I was on the podcast. Oh. And I really don't like 911 calls. And I was listening to a 911 call on the show. Mm. You haven't done many of them. And in the end, we found out that the, the, the girl was faking like the 911 oh, call. Oh, well, yeah, I, was, I know. The Jennifer Pan. I was Pan. stressed. I, Jennifer Pan, and I was stressing out. And my foot was going down because of the stress, and I got pulled over. So you owe me. And I got a $200 American dollar, $5 billion Canadian dollar ticket. So I don't owe you anything because I'm not responsible for anything that you do. You are responsible for my actions, Mike. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. I'm not I'm not picking that up. Nope. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I was I was going about fast and it was it was a red Mustang. Anyway. So thank you, Brianna, and thank you, Stacy. Keep those NFTs coming. Yeah, exactly. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. So there you have it. That is the end of the show. So until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye, y'all. Bye.